Welcome to the Church on the Hill Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this week's message by Pastor Michael McReynolds. If you have any questions about the message or about the church or would like to know more about who we are, please feel free to contact our church office through the contact information located here on the website. Let's, uh, let's go ahead, uh, Nancy. Here's a couple things I want to say. First of all, I really want to start with just a, a definition. Uh, mother. Mother. Everybody say that with me. Mother. Uh, a noun. One person who does the work of 20 for free. <laughs> or a synonym. A masochist. Looney. Or a saint. Obviously, that's not really Webster's Dictionary, uh, but uh, that's, that's funny. Okay, here's the next one. I want to just share with a couple of things. A, a quote from Samuel Coolidge, The love of a mother is the veil of a softer light between the heart and the heavenly father. Some of you need to think on that one for a while. The love of a mother is the veil of a softer light between the heart and the heavenly father. I find that so good. Look at this one. Here's another one. God couldn't be everywhere, therefore he made mothers. That's Rudyard Kipling. And then this one really is good. My mother had a great deal of trouble with me, but I think she enjoyed it. That was Mark Twain again. If, you don't, if you've never read Mark Twain, you ought to do yourself a favor. You ought to read Mark Twain. Uh, okay, so here's another one. Look at this. To mom, I'm hungry, I'm cold, I'm hot. Can I have... I want to watch. Where are you? Can you ask dad? Can you help me? He hurt me. She hurt me. I want to go there. When are we? Why are we? Why can't we? That's what we say to mom. To dad. Where's, where's mom? <laughs> is that true? That's, that's true. Come on. You know that's true. That is so true. I tell my wife all the time, my kids do not talk to me. She said, they always talk to me. I said, I know, I know. All they ask me is, where's mom? And then finally, this is kind of cute. Here you go. See, I told you, that's how she does it, that moms have a cape in the closet. Moms have a cape in the closet. And then, and then this, I just, this picture was so stunning to me, I just had to share it. Isn't that stunning? Isn't that great? Praise God. You know, uh, there's nothing quite like a mom. I don't know. Um, you know, sometimes we don't necessarily have the best experiences with moms. But can I tell you what? They're just people like us. And, uh, and they do their best, right? And so we always, whatever your memories are of your mom, you need to just be thankful that without her, you wouldn't be here. And just remember mothers on Mother's Day and just be a blessing to them. And, uh, and you know, we, we, we make it so much in our culture about ourselves, Mother's Day, that I'm a mother, I'm a mother. No, no, let's make it about the one that got us here. How about that? And be thankful for them. So, hey, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1. We're going to continue uh, in, in this series. We started in our series on the Holy Spirit about five weeks ago. And then last week we made a transition, an in-flight transition. Uh, we, we were preaching about the Holy Spirit, and yet we transitioned into a series that I'm going to be doing on uh, the book of Nehemiah. And from the book of Nehemiah, what we, we find out that is Nehemiah serves as a type of the Holy Spirit who is at work in our lives. Uh, and I even prayed with someone about it this morning. A lot of us come to Christ. We know we're saved. We become Christians, but we have a lot of stuff that hangs on in our lives. We have a lot of baggage and stuff that just keeps hanging on. And so the Holy Spirit serves for us, uh, or Nehemiah rather, serves for us as a type of the Holy Spirit, re reconciling, restoring, and rebuilding the lives of, our, of believers. He's working to help you and I reclaim everything that was lost in the fall in the Garden of Eden many, many years ago. So let's read this together. Look, let's go. Chapter 1, uh, Nehemiah. I'm just going to read it from here. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, 
The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province there and are in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and the gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And then we'll go to a New Testament reference that I want to make. Chapter 5, uh, book of 1 Peter, chapter 5, uh, beginning at verse 8. And Peter said, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after you have suffered a while, perfect, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. And then let's look at that just last verse from the Amplified Bible. Amplified, verse 10. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who imparts all blessing and favor, who has called you to his own eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself complete and make you what you ought to be. Can I get an amen on that one? How many are thankful that God's not done working on you yet? We're thankful too. Okay, so who, he's going to make you what you ought to be. Establish and ground you securely, strengthen and settle you. What God started, God plans to finish. How many would say amen to that? And aren't you glad? So let's pray. Father, thank you for the word. Lord, we ask that you would just enliven our hearts and our ears to hear. And that, Lord God, you would just give us, Father, faith to uh, receive and believe and be exactly who you need us to be in Jesus' name. So, Andy, are we live? Is it happening or not? Okay. Uh, pretty soon, just so you'll be aware, this is not to let you know so you can stay home from church, but we're, we're working on being able to live stream our services. Uh, they'll go Facebook Live, and then they'll also be going live on YouTube. So that is coming. So wherever you are in the world of Hill County, you'll be able to turn on your laptop, computer, or phone and watch us here on Sunday morning. How many of you would think that's exciting? That doesn't mean that you don't come to church anymore. That means that those that can't or uh, would like to know about us, you know, some people in the county still thinks, still think we let snakes loose every Sunday and then try to catch them. Uh, that's really not how we deal with them. I deal with snakes with a shovel or a hoe. Uh, that's my favorite. And if I'm really scared, the 12 gauge works wonders. So um, we, we transitioned last week. Now we're in this series. I want to talk to you this morning about being established, being strengthened, and being settled. And, and I really want you to get this. It, it, as we begin, it's important to come to a clear understanding about the fall of man. If you've been around church for a while, or actually just living a while, there's always this uh, discussion about what happened in the Garden of Eden. What happened when Adam, quote, fell, and how in the world could something that happened so many thousands of years ago have any, any relevance, any implication for me or for you today. And so it's really important that you know what we lost so that we can understand why the Holy Spirit wants to help you and how he wants to help you recover that. What does God really want us to grab a hold of? So those two little words, the fall, to me they imply that God originally designed mankind for something far greater than we're experiencing. That God intended man to, for, for a higher destiny, a, a higher plane of existence than we're now experiencing. And Genesis tells us that people were created in the perfect image of God before sin entered the world. When Adam fell, we call it the fall, sin entered the world and everything was drastically changed. Now, I'm going to be intentionally redundant in this series because I want to massage in the truths that we're sharing so you'll get it. So you understand, if you look around the world today, how many would say and agree with me with this saying, the world is messed up? Anybody? Man, the world, if you, as you look at the world, you think, what in the world is going on in, in the lives of mankind? Why is there so much violence? Why is there so much greed? Why is there so much trouble? 
Why, why, why do things continue to happen the way they do? It all traces back to the first chapter of the book of Genesis. If you want to get theology straight, start in the beginning. Begin to understand, look at the book of Genesis and understand that therein the beginnings are laid out for us. Okay? So, two little words. The fall implies some really amazing things. So, in the, look at this. There are three essential truths that you really need to grab a hold of uh, so you'll, you'll understand. Here it is, number one. Man was created in the image of God with a divine destiny and a purpose. You've got to believe that, that there's something more to life than what we're seeing. Genesis 1, 27, so God created man in his own image and in the image of God he created him. Male and female he created him. Second thing is this, man was given dominion over all the earth. Now, therefore, you and I, man, mankind, are responsible for how we steward this planet, this earth, in everything from family relationships to the management of natural resources, creative development. God gave us dominion. God gave men dominion. Chapter 1, Genesis, verse 28. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on earth. So number one, we were created in God's image. Number two, we've been given dominion. We've been given dominion. Number three... Man's authority and ability to exercise dominion or rule is found in his continued obedience and relationship with God. That you cannot walk in dominion, you cannot walk in the rule uh, that God, the rulership that God intended us for walk in if you're out of relationship with God. If you're not in relationship with him and you're not bound to him, in a, in a loving, obedient relationship, then you'll never, ever walk in the fullness of all that God has for you in your life. Everybody tracking with me? Okay, so here we go. Here's an important principle that's often overlooked. We don't really talk about this much, but we really need to. We talk about the first, but not the second. Relationship and rulership are fundamental to our created purpose. Relationship, of course, God sent Christ, allowed Christ to die on the cross. It's by his sacrifice, his atoning sacrifice, that the way into the presence of God was open for us once again. However, there's more to it than just that. God also wants us to rule and reign. But here's another thing we don't realize. Both of these were broken in the fall. Both of them were broken and lost in the fall. Relationship was severed and rulership was abdicated. When we allowed sin, when sin came in because of Adam's choice, what happened was that rulership was abdicated. Without a recovery of our creator's original design, the purpose for which we were created will never be fulfilled. Until the impact of the fall had, that has had on us is dealt with, you and I are never going to live in the fullness of the abundant life that Jesus promised for us. People think, well, man, I'm just struggling because. Let me tell you, we're struggling. Well, let me, let me ask anybody a question. Anybody ever spend time in West Texas? Anybody ever spend time in West Texas? Whatever you find in West Texas that won't stick you will bite you. Let me tell you, the Garden of Eden wasn't like that. Do you understand it? Every time I go out there and have to deal with thorny stuff, I think, man, Adam, you blew it. You blew it. That wasn't present, folks, until the fall. The world, now those are beautiful plants. Yes, God created those and allowed them to flourish. But let me just give you an idea, folks. We need to return. Without returning to God's intended purpose for us, we will, without finding him in relationship, uh, the relationship of atonement and reconciliation, you will never experience his divine purpose. So I wanted to cover a little bit about the fall today because until we grasp the magnitude of what we lost, Lost. We lost relationship and we lost dominion. We, were, we, we had dominion given to us and we lost it. You will never regain it until you come to full salvation in Jesus Christ. So here we go. Point number one, the beginning of God's redemptive purpose. 
What was this all about? The beginning of God's redemptive purpose. Luke 19 verse 10 says this, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He's come to seek and to save that which was lost. What was lost? Dominion was lost. Relationship was lost. The image of God in man was lost. It was compromised in sin. For the most part, Christian teaching and preaching focuses on the restoration of relationship with God. We love the, the truth of the fact that the cross bridges the gap that sin created between God and man. It's the fundamental starting point for us. In fact, Jesus made it clear when he said this. Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Paul uh, reiterated it when he said this in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Confession of the Lord Jesus Christ, being born again is where we begin, but that's where many stop. You and I will never come to the full understanding of God's redemptive purpose unless we move on from that place. Unless we say, Lord, I want everything that you have for me. Look at this. Restored relationship is primary, but it does not conclude God's purpose for, in life for us. His desire is to restore dominion and rule. God created the earth and he entrusted it to men to rule over. So God's intention for us is not just to get saved and go to heaven, but his intention for us is to be conformed to the image of Christ, renewed in the spirit of your mind, and to actually begin to rule and reign with him. Not only over creative things, but here, listen to me, this means the recovery of self-control. It means the recovery of personal identity. It means the recovery of stable temperament and righteous character. I'm really, it breaks my heart when I hear the bad and sad testimony of a lot of Christians and then I hear the world tell me, well, we don't go to church because all those hypocrites go there. Well, you don't mind going to work with them and you go to the gym and work out with them, but, but we seem to have a problem going to church with them. What better place for all the hypocrites to be than right here? God can get a hold of us. What needs to happen is a transformation of character. God wants to transform your character. Jesus does not want you to stay the same. Uh, you're born again. If that was all that he wanted, you'd have died right then. God expects you and I to be conformed, transformed into his image. Not only does he want to give us dominion over created things, but God wants you to recover your self-control. God wants you to be able to be, to have a personal identity that's founded in him. In fact, it's the literal fulfillment, look, of Romans 5, 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. They're going to reign in life. The New Living translates this to me to, to, is very well. The New Living says, uh, for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. God's intent for you is to live in triumph over sin. God's intention for me is for me to live with self-control, with a righteous character. God's intent is for you to actually enjoy living with joy. He, he wants you to actually uh, enjoy life. It's not just, oh my God, I got to hold on till I get to heaven. God wants you to begin to walk in the fullness and the abundance of who he is right here and now. Yes. Just turn to your neighbor and say this. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? That's what God wants for us right now. So look at this. Receiving the abundance of grace results in a life restored to its original purpose. One that stands against the attack of the adversary that has been established, strengthened, and settled. God wants us to have the original purpose for that we were created to live in to be restored to us. He wants you to begin to live in victory over your lust, over your passions, over your desires and your temptations. He wants you to begin to live joyfully free. 1 Peter 5, uh, verse 10, says it again, but may God, the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you've suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. 
Man, God, that's so good. Look at this. The cross focuses on a restored relationship, but the essence of the Holy Spirit's rebuilding project is focused upon restored dominion or rule. Whenever we talk about baptism of the Holy Spirit, we always tend to get drift. We drift left or right. We want to talk about gifts. We want to talk about tongues. We want to talk about fruit. But what we miss, the point we're missing is the whole intention of the outpouring of Holy Spirit in this earth was for us to begin to walk again in the dominion and rule that we were originally created to have. That God wants to rebuild your personality. He wants to reshape your life. He wants to help you recover from the fall. And, and I'll never forget when I first got born again, I went over and told my little sister, hey, you'll never guess what happened to me. I accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And you know what she said? Well, you weren't such a bad guy. My gosh, I was a whoremonger and a drug user and a drunk. I, I mean, my life was a total disaster, naturally, physically, and, and you know, and, the, and the, the worst part about it, I was having the time of my life and not looking to change. And I ran head first into Jesus Christ. And can I tell you what? Everything changed. Yes. Everything changed. And, and, and God wants you and I to understand the focus of the Holy Spirit's rebuilding project in our lives is to restore the dominion and rule. And so let me unpack that a little farther. In the opening conversation between Nehemiah and his relative who has returned to Jerusalem, it reveals the crux of our problem. Here it is, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3. And he said to me, now this is Hanani talking to Nehemiah, the survivors who are left in captivity in the province are in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and the gates are burned with fire. That's, that, that's real, it's, it's indicating something to us here. Look at this. The Jews had returned to Jerusalem under the decree of Cyrus. The temple was being rebuilt and the worship uh, 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 and, uh, and relationship with God was being restored. But the city and its gates, uh, the city, the gates were burned with fire. The walls were in ruins. There was no center of government. Nothing could function anymore. You say, well, no, we had the church built. Everything's good. No, that was just the beginning. That was just the beginning. See, in ancient times, the city gates were the seat of local authority, of government, and of rule. The walls served to protect and preserve that authority. The rule and the assets of the kingdom were protected by the gates as the seat of government and the walls. Now, these guys had come back to Jerusalem. With, with, actually, without walls, the enemy was, was free to raid and to plunder just as they pleased. He could ride in and ride out and, ne and never even be challenged. Okay? In short, the Jews had rebuilt the temple. They had acknowledged their relationship with God. But let me say this very sadly this morning. There was no evidence that it had any effect on their daily life. That's the sad testimony of someone that says they're a believer in Christ. Well, yeah, I'm saved. No, I'm a Christian, but it really doesn't affect the way I live. It doesn't really change anything about me. They had a profession of their of faith, but they did not have possession of what God intended for them to have. They had a profession of faith. Oh, yes, I believe, but they had not laid hold of the promise. They had not begun to live in the victory of all that God had for them. So now, at the return of Nehemiah, God is looking to recover his people's identity. He wants to restore them as a self-governing race. He wants to restore the city and rebuild the center of authority of righteousness and strength. When we get saved, the relationship is restored. When Holy Spirit comes into your life, then you begin to have the equipment you need, the person you need to help you rule and reign to help you live above the flesh, to help you live above the temptations of this life. So instead of settling for life among the ruins and wreckage of the destroyed city, these people would again learn, man, we can reign, we can rule. How many of us have experienced the very same dilemma in our life? We've accepted Christ, we, we started coming to church, but if we're honest, we would say this morning, hey, you know what, there's still parts of our personality, there's still parts of my personal life that are in direct, direct contradiction to the power of the God that we say we worship. If we get brutally honest, we can all identify with the sense of shame and reproach that Hanani and Nehemiah felt. 
We know we, we were saved, but there's brokenness and there's failure. And so much of my life is just burned over rubble. But can I tell you this morning, this is not cause for despair. There's a word of hope in Nehemiah for you this morning. There's a word of hope for me. I no longer am tormented by everything I did before I got saved. You know why? I have put it under the blood. And the Holy Spirit is giving me a new mind day by day. Every step that I take, he's renewing my mind. He's renewing my life. I'm no longer tormented about what, by what once was. Every soul tie, everything that's attached me to my past has been broken by the blood of Christ. And I have been empowered to live free. And you can be there too. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not perfect. I told you last week when I get stuck in traffic, there's another man that, that comes out sometimes. Driving in Texas, driving anywhere is crazy. We just spent uh, uh, almost a week in San Francisco. And you know what? Everywhere we went, we rode Uber and Lyft. You know why? I just get to look out the window and not worry about it. <laughs> I was going to rent a car, and then when I began to look at the ramifications of driving a car in San Francisco, parking a car, uh, dealing with the car, paying $4.50 a gallon for gas, I said, forget that. I'll let the Uber driver handle it. So please understand, Christ has called us to salvation. Nehemiah this morning brings us the same message of hope that he brought to these people who, could not, who, who would not only recover their relationship with God, but they would move forward into the full potential of heirs and citizens and sons. They'd begin to walk in the fullness of all that God has for them. Nehemiah is the handbook on recovery. It's the handbook on recovery. It's in Nehemiah that we see the picture of hope for us as well. Let me, let me just uh, illustrate it like this. Our restored relationship for God is the rebuilt temple, and it can also be matched with two more things. The rulership and the regained self-control, that's the restored gates, and the reconstruction of our self-understanding and purpose, that's the rebuilt walls. That's really powerful to help you understand this book of Nehemiah. The temple was rebuilt. That talks about our relationship. When then he says, hey, we're going to rebuild the gates. That talks about the restoration of self-control and discipline in our lives. A lot of people think discipline is a four-letter word. It's not a cuss word. It's a necessary word if you're a Christian. It's a necessary word. But then the construction of the walls is the, it's the reconstruction of your self-understanding and, and the reapprehension of your divine destiny and purpose. Everybody tracking? Listen, we need to rise from the rubble. We, we've, a lot of people have been church going for years, but they still struggle with lust and anger and, and the lock, lack of self-control. They're, they're blown by every wind of pop culture, whatever's going on. I mean, they're more worldly than the world a lot of times. And it's heartbreaking. Uh, you know, we, we've lost the, the incredible respect for the word of God and the authority of God. And we live our lives as we think we're in control. God wants to restore in you the kingdom rulership and dominion that he gave you in the very beginning. So here's number two, rising from the ruins of the past. Nehemiah chapter two, verse 13 and 14. And I went out by night through the valley of the gate of the serpent well and the refuse gate. And I viewed the walls of Jer Jerusalem, which were broken down and its gates, which were burned with fire. And then I went to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal under me to pass. It's the middle of the night. Nehemiah rises up, gets on his donkey, and he rides through the whole city of Jerusalem. And he surveys the incredible damage that's there. Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem, and, and he's confronted with its sad condition. You see, Israel had walked through years of disobedience. They miserably failed God. They had many, many exhortations and warnings to repent and return to him, and they wouldn't, and judgment falls on them. They were carried away into captivity. Jerusalem was raised. It was, it was just torn to the ground. It was completely to destroy, destroy. But I want you to get something. Look at this. Such judgment is not so much an, uh, an act of God's anger as it is simply the result of disobedience. See, a lot of people in our culture today, in fact, uh, how many of you have ever watched the movie The Patriot? Anybody watch the movie The Patriot? How many of you like the movie The Patriot? Did you enjoy it? Okay, it's a really good movie. It has really bad theology. 
The very beginning, what happens is Mel Gibson talks about how I've always feared that the sins of my youth would come back to haunt me. That's a very, a very rough paraphrase. How many of you know that's not good theology? We live under this sense that God is punitive. Well, this stuff is the dishwasher broke. God must be mad at me. How many of you know the dishwasher just broke? Dishwashers wear out. People say that to me all the time. Oh, man, this stuff is happening, man. God must be just really ticked off at me. That's not the heart of your father, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I mean, I had a flat tire on the way to work. Well, have you rotated them lately? Did you happen to notice that they had no tread on them? Did you happen to notice that there is some personal responsibility involved in the maintenance of the things that you own? Oh, shoot, really? Are you kidding me? Yeah, you actually have to be responsible. So God is not punitive. When I say this, such judgment is not so much an act of God's anger as it is simply the result of disobedience. God does not have to enact judgment on every sin because most sin carries with it the deadly seeds of its own penalty. God's not judging every single sin because what you plant in your garden will come up. And a lot of times people are very upset about what's coming up in their lives and they soon forget that they're the ones that sowed the seed in the beginning. What you plant will come up. When sin is sown, judgment will come as a harvest. People uh, often introduce judgment upon their own lives uh, just because they're not very careful. Their records and the failures, their failures and their, and their disobediences leave a residue Yes, they're born again, but you know, uh, if you were a mass murderer before you get saved and you get arrested for it, you're probably going to go to prison for it. How many of you know you might even go, uh, you might even lose your life for it, but can you still go to heaven? Yeah, but what you sow, you're going to reap. And we really don't like that in our culture today because nobody wants to be responsible for anything. But can I tell you, there's only one person responsible for what comes into your life, and it's you. Now, there's a lot of things that come into our lives collaterally that we don't engage, that we don't invite, and they just happen because of the course of the flow of life. But folks, God does not have to enact sin for uh, judgment on every sin because most sin carries its own penalty. If that was true with Israel, it's true for us. They rebuilt the temple. They returned to worship of the one true God. But the rubble and the ruin of the city that surrounded them was a sad reminder of the humiliating evidence of their past. Continually, they're reminded of, man, we blew it. We failed. We blew it. So often that's so true with us. Our lives are often a paradox between the possession of a new life in Christ and the inability to live fully free as a new creature in Christ. I want you to grab a hold of that because a lot of young Christians falter right here. They know they had an experience with God. Man, they're joyous. They're on fire. They're just really living it. Boy, they accepted Christ. They have this rush of passion and enthusiasm, and they're wanting to sing worship songs all day and carry their Bible everywhere they go. Their whole family thinks they've gone nuts. And yet they're just so passionate and they're on fire with God. And then all of a sudden they slip up and they cuss or they mess up and do something they shouldn't or they stumble and they fall. And the enemy comes in like a flood and says, you're not really a Christian. You're not really born again. You're not really a son of God. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Everyone knows what I'm talking about if you're saved because you've all had that experience. Man, I thought I would never sin again. I thought I would never blow it ever again. And then I stubbed my toe and face planted. Anybody can relate to that? And you struggle. And see, that's where a lot of us, we mess. And then we don't have the right teaching to know how to move beyond that. Because our lives are a paradox between the possession of this new life in Christ and the inability to live fully free as a new creature in Christ. Let me ask you this. Have you ever asked yourself this question? Why can't I shut depressive thoughts out of my mind? Well, why am I stricken with fear and with doubt? Why can't I defend myself against temptation? Here's a biggie. Why do I feel so worthless? Shouldn't our relationship with God be enough to keep out those unwanted thoughts and attitudes? Or could it be that there is something more? There's a deeper aspect of salvation that we've yet to lay hold of. Folks, that's the dominion. That's the ruling and the reigning with Christ that I'm talking about. 
We struggle. We struggle with our flesh. We all blow it. We all mess up. And the enemy loves to take advantage in those moments. He loves to take advantage. This is not a real amen shouter, but are y'all paying attention? Let me tell you, folks, a lot of young believers stumble and fall because of this, and nobody ever tells them, hey, you know what? You're not there yet. You're on the way. Salvation was a beginning, not an end. It was a beginning. You're becoming new in Christ. We struggle with our flesh, and we wonder why. We struggle with depression and anger and lust, and, and we wonder why. And those, some of those habits keep popping up like stains in the carpet that won't go away. You ever clean carpet? I'm not sure that carpet cleaning, I think that's kind of like insurance. Man, that's like a never-ending deal. You just keep paying it, and you just keep hoping it gets better, and it just never seems to work. Have you ever experienced that? We do it around here. We, you know, that, that grape juice that gets spilled all over here every month. We clean it, we clean it, and it just keeps coming back. It's a bad habit. Habit. Folks, look at this. Through the cross of Christ, we have a restored pathway to relationship with our Father. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can recover the stability, purity, and peace of the abundant life in Christ. It's the Holy Spirit that Jesus sent to help us get there. He sent Holy Spirit to help you live above this world. The Holy Spirit has been given as a gift to us. We no longer have to live among the rubble and the ruins of our failures. We no longer have to be controlled by our habits and our sins. We no longer have to listen to the harassment and the mocking reproach of the enemy every time you blow it. You can put an end to it this morning. The temple is rebuilt at salvation, but the rebuilding of the walls and the restoration of the gates is a process that rises from the ruin of our lives. We tend to forget that it's a process that you are, if any man be in Christ, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If you study that out, it means it says all things are becoming new. You're becoming new. Yes, you were positionally, eternally sanctified when you accepted Jesus Christ, when you repented of your sins and fully surrendered to him. You were, it was forever written in heaven. You were sealed at that moment with the seal of the Holy Spirit so that you are secure in that. But you are still here living now and the process is being walked out day by day, step by step. You are being, sanctification is instantaneous and progressive. Are you tracking? And we struggle because we think, well, man, I, I prayed the prayer. I accepted Jesus. I sing those songs with Preston for hours every Sunday. I ought to be able to just live in victory. I'm living in victory. And then we blow it. Then we mess up and we stumble and we fall. And the enemy comes in with condemnation like a flood. But I've got great news. Paul has already told us there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So if you're intentionally, deliberately, and willingly seeking after Christ, pressing into Christ, there's no condemnation this morning when you fail, when you stumble, and when you fall. You have an advocate with the Father this morning who pleads your case before the throne. Man, you ought to shout now. That was a great amen point right there. You've got an advocate with the Father this morning. Man, I'll say, so, so here we go. Point number three, the perfect work of patience. I'm praying that you'll have patience to let me finish. Everybody good? Okay, so check this out. The perfect work of patience. I just quoted it. Let me read it again. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That literally translates are becoming new. James said this, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. How many do you know that live in the victory of that? A guy just T-boned my truck. Well, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I only know one person that really responded like that, and that was Dan Moeller. I don't know many other people that came out of a car wreck just thanking God and praying for the person that just hit him. I have a good friend. He had a motorcycle wreck. A lady pulled out in front of him. It was one of those moments for you bikers where there was gravel in the road. They pulled out. He slammed on the brakes and couldn't stop and slid into the car. And it, it, it uh, pinned him between the tank and, and the handlebars and threw him over the handlebars. So it dislocated his hip. 
and he's a six foot seven uh, guy, uh, incredible guy, and he hit the ground. He's a godly guy. But I said, man, Phil, how did you manage? And he said, well, he said, the guy came out of the car. He ran up and said, are you okay? And he said, I tried to get him. He said, I reached for him and I went, oh, I felt like Jacob. I fell on the ground. Well, that's how most people respond, right? He wasn't going, bless you, brother. No, I'm fine. He was like, if I get a hold of you, you." this guy was a combat engineer in Vietnam. He was a tough guy. He was like, I'm going to get that man. That's how most of us respond. Can I tell you something, folks? James tells us something. He says, verse 3, knowing the testing of your faith produces patience. I was told as a young believer, don't pray for patience. It brings tribulation. Can I say you need to pray for patience because tribulation is coming no matter what. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Okay. Many who have come to saving faith in Christ Jesus struggle learning to walk as a disciple because they remain crippled by their failure and by their sin. They keep blowing it. They keep messing up. The enemy keeps reminding them of their past. And and so what happens is they just struggle to learn to walk as a disciple. Every one of us seeks to hurry up our growth in Christ. And what happens? We become frustrated. We get confused. We get discouraged. Because why? We live in a drive-through, instant internet culture that we think things ought to change immediately. How many of you garden? Anybody here like to garden? Have you ever had much success planting things and standing over the garden, commanding them to grow? Does that work? You just plant the corn seed and then stand there and yell, come out. And what happens? Nothing. Well, see, we, that's the, the culture that we live in tells us it ought to all be now. I want what I want, and I want it now. And unfortunately, the, the, the adage of our day, and I really don't care who it hurts for me to have what I want. It's a sad testimony. Folks, we, we come to faith, and we seek to hurry our growth in Christ, and we get frustrated, we get confused, and we get discouraged because the results don't come as quickly as we think they should. But becoming a new creature in Christ is just the beginning. All things are made new, but time is required for the full measure of the new man to grow and to manifest. The new birth opens for us a world of potential and possibility and freedom from our sins that dominated and controlled us in our past. But full dominion in Christ's rule for that to penetrate our entire personality, the re-you needs to be rebuilt. You need to be restored. You need to be renovated. And that is a process. Anybody ever done renovation in your home? Anybody ever done any remodeling in your house while you live there? Anybody? That is almost like hell on earth, if you'd forgive me. If you think I'm cussing, I'm sorry, I'm really not. But, I mean, oh, my gosh, when we, we did it, we remodeled most of our house and lived there through it. And then a few years later decided we needed to do more. It's like, what was wrong with us? And yet, you know, it's not a pleasant, clean process. It's a timely process. For full dominion of Christ's rule to penetrate our personality, it's going to take some time. Most of us need considerable repair. And until we let patience have its perfect work, we'll never fully realize what God's doing and what he wants to do. Here's three important stages of this rebuilding process. Let me just articulate it for you. There's three important stages. Number one, partner with the Holy Spirit. He's our Nehemiah. You're going to have to welcome him. You're going to have to say, Lord, I want to be, I want your partnership. I want your partnership. Number two, you're going to have to ask him to identify your broken down walls and burned out gates. I shared last week, and I'm going to just share it again. If you're struggling with things that you just can't get over, we've got a great ministry here in our church called Pursuing Freedom, and we want you to be free. We want you to live free. So if you're struggling with things that you just can't seem to get out of your life, we want to recommend to you, call our office. We will will connect you with the people that you need to talk to. And let me tell you something, we're seeing amazing results in people's lives. And, and this is not like the movie The Exorcist or anything, so don't freak out. 
It's called real Christianity, folks. It's called real life and real freedom in Jesus. So number two, you've got to ask him to identify. See, a lot of times we don't even know we have these issues. And yet we do. So you've got to ask him to help you. And then number three, you've got to do the work necessary to rebuild the walls and gates in our lives with the Holy Spirit's help. You've got to be willing to say, Lord, I want to discipline my life. I want to change my life. I want to, be, I want to make a choice. I love it. I love what Kim Pittner taught us a few months ago. If you'll take one step in the natural, God will supply the supernatural. As you move towards God, he'll move towards you. If you just keep sitting where you are, hands in your pockets, saying, well, if God really wanted me to have it, he'd just give it to me. Well, guess what? You're not going to advance very far, very fast. But if you decide today, hey, I want my family to be raised differently. I want my future to look differently. I've got good news for you. Jesus Christ will make a way for you. If you'd have met me 38 years ago, you would not have liked me. You might not like me now, but I don't want to be, pre- I don't want to be presumptuous. Uh, you know, if you'd have met me 38 years ago, I was a, gr- a vastly different human being. And I'll tell you, God has done and is doing an amazing work, and he's not done yet. Hallelujah. My wife will amen that. We just celebrated 35 years of marriage. She's watched an amazing transformation. Jesus can do it, and he's willing to do it in you today. Wow. Folks, hear me. Not only will our spirit, once dead in trespasses and sins, be reborn, but your mind, your emotions, and your will will be restored as well. Wherever you've been vulnerable, wherever you're being overrun by the enemy, God longs to reestablish you and secure you by the power of his love. I woke up this morning singing that song, and I can only remember one line, and it's about the foundation of our lives is built on the love of God. And I'm not really quoting it right, but man, I, I just woke up with that melody going in my head. And it was like, boy, you know, what is the foundation of my life? It's the love of God. It's the love of God that I can stand this morning on the love of God. The love of God is the power of God, and the power of God is the love of God. And a God who loves you is not content for you to live frustrated, angry, uh, uh, failing, and struggling. God wants to make a way for you. He's made a way for you. But sometimes uh, you just have to get up and walk in it. Here's the way, walk you in it. We keep sitting around thinking he's going to do it for us, but you're going to have to move towards him. And if you move towards him, he'll move towards you. Listen, the broken down walls and burned out gates of our own personalities are not always the result of our own sin. I want to say this very, very carefully. In Jerusalem, they inherited that condition. Sometimes the stuff you're struggling with is, wasn't your fault. Sometimes the stuff that you're struggling with, now, now let, me, let me give you a, a qualification here. Let me make a disclaimer. A lot of people say, well, you know, mama dropped me on my head when I was little, and that's why I have these problems. You can't put it all on mama. I understand some people are abusive. I understand some bad things have happened to good people. And I also understand that those leave scars and wounds in your life. The good news is our God is a redeeming, reconciling, restoring, rebuilding God. And he will give you a new life and a new future. And he can help you move beyond that. You have to decide this morning that you will no longer let your past be your identity. You will no longer be defined by it. You cannot change it, but you You can put an end to that chapter and you can move beyond it in beyond it in victory. But you have to decide that. You have to decide. Stuff that I mean, stuff happens to people. But you know what? You've got a God who's made a way for you to even redeem the most horrific, horrible thing that's happened in your life and turn it into something beautiful. Are y'all hearing me today? Man, y'all, it's so true. Look, uh, Jerusalem was a mess, but it was not the direct result of their own action or failure. The, The destruction of the city was the price of another generation's failure. Some of us have been hindered from reigning in life because of inherited difficulties or personality weaknesses that have been transmitted to us from other generations. They've come to us through mistreatment or through abuse uh, or, or sometimes just evil intention, sometimes just ignorance. But listen, folks, 
God wants to heal that this morning. God wants you to move beyond that. God wants you to quit uh, using that as some sort of crutch or holding on to that as some sort of identity. He wants you to be free and he wants you to live in victory. And can I tell you some really good news? He might just use your abuse, your violation, your betrayal, and your victory to help someone else in the future. But you've got to decide, man, Lord, I'm going to be free in Jesus' name. I'm going to be free in Jesus' name. The, re the wreckage of our lives can be considerable. And even the best intentioned effort to, quote, get it all together will fail to rebuild the walls of our personalities. It's going to take some help from heaven. It's going to take help from heaven. And I've got great news. When we dedicate ourselves to Christian discipline, it's a good thing. But we often find ourselves frustrated and unable to stand against temptation and sin. We made a decision, but man, we're struggling. This is when we must fall wholly on the mercy of Jesus and cry out for our Nehemiah. This is when Holy Spirit needs to come and to fill. And I'll tell you what, what a setup this morning. Did you pay attention to all the words that were given this morning? How many times the Lord said, hey, the river's flowing. If you want it, come and get it. If you want it, you got to come and get it. You know what? We keep sitting on our hands saying, well, if God wants me to have it, he'll just give it to me. He's already made the way. You're going to have to decide that you want it. You're going to have to make a decision. I'll tell you what, folks, I, I had a tremendous, incredible, uh, some of you don't know my testimony, some of you do. I mean, I had, a, I had a radical encounter with the living God. I had a radical encounter. I was a barroom musician, and every night I heard the same thing every night at the end of the night, last call, last call. Heard it every night that I played music for a living. Well, I'll tell you what, I had a dream that my life, I had a dream that my home was on fire. I sat up in my bed just as the ceiling of my house was falling in on me in fire. And if you know anything about fire, fire is a, is a, is a crazy thing. If you've got any experience with firemen, you know how horrific that is. I sat up and, and I was literally on fire and I woke up and I was sitting in my bed looking around the room in the dark. And I was, something was on fire, but it was me. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, as clear as I'm talking to you this morning, it's your last call. I'll come for you no more. You know what I did? I was scared to life. I jumped out of bed, called my good friend who'd been witnessing to me and said, man, I got to get saved right now. He said, it's 3.30 in the morning. You just woke me and my family up. I said, I don't care. You got to pray with me right now. And he hung up on me. That's how not to witness to your friends. I'm just helping you. He hung up on me. We were working together at a music store. I got to the music store all the way to work. I was scared to debt to life. I was scared. It was like, I'm going to die. I was under conviction, constrained of my sins. Can I tell you, the Holy Spirit was working in me. It was working in me, drawing me. Our God is such a merciful, loving, loving and compassionate Father. This morning, he has sent the helper to come to help you. That was a salvation experience three days after I got saved. I went to a prayer meeting to pray for my lost Jewish girlfriend. And when I went down to the front, they said, what can we, what can we pray for you about? And I said, I need the Holy Spirit. It came out of my mouth. I don't know who said it. I'm serious. I was headed down there. They were, they were a bunch of charismatic Catholics. I thought they were totally crazy. I did. And I went down to front and I said, they said, what do you need? And I said, the Holy Spirit. And they all went, yeah. And that scared me more. I was like, yeah, what? Who said that? But can I tell you, folks, they laid hands on me and prayed for me. And from that moment, my life was irreparably changed because Holy Spirit came in. And guess what started? The rebuilding started and the reformation started. And I don't care who you are or where you are, or what you've been through or what you've done since you, quote, accepted Christ, our Savior has a redeeming healing, the paraclete, the comforter, the encourager, the helper, the Holy Spirit friend. He wants to come this morning and he wants to heal everything broken in you. Some of you need to put a period at your past. Some of you have been allowing the abuse and the violation of your childhood or your married life, the failed marriages or whatever it is, you've been allowing that to define your present and your future. And today's the day that you need to say no more, no more.
I'm not going to allow my failures to affect me anymore. Some of you have accepted Christ and you keep struggling with the same old habit you've been struggling with for years. You keep going back to something that's never going to provide victory for you, but you keep going back and you just feel helpless to stop. Good news. There is a Holy Spirit this morning that wants to help you. There's a Holy Spirit that wants to heal you. There's a Holy Spirit that wants to give you dominion and wants to give you the strength. Oh God, help us. I want you to stand to your feet with me today. I just want you to, I just want you to listen as I read what Jesus had to say. Jesus said, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper, a comforter, an encourager, a counselor, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, who the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. To me, this is a picture of something so vivid. It's the picture of a friend who's in distress and he's calling out. He's calling out. And the helper says, I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna help you this morning. I've got great news for you. God wants you to live in freedom. God wants to give you the smile back. God wants you to begin to rejoice in your salvation again. Maybe you've never known the joy of being saved. Maybe you've never experienced it. God wants to fill you up with something that will take you beyond where you've been. God wants to deliver you this morning. God wants to help you this morning. He wants to help me this morning. Nehemiah discovers the temple. The temple's been rebuilt. The walls are down. The gates are burned with fire. The enemy's taken advantage. God has made a way for you to be rebuilt this morning. God's made a way for you to be free this morning. Would you just close your eyes with me? Maybe just open your hands like this, everyone across the room. Just open your hands before the Lord. The prayer teams, I'm gonna invite you guys to come and just come and stand in front. Lord, we just, just want you to close your eyes and open your hands as they're coming and they're moving to the front. I just want you to, just to open your life to the Lord. Maybe you just need to stop for a moment and say, I was abused as a child. I was sexually molested. I was ripped off by my good friends. I, I, I've been through a, a horrible, terrible divorce. I, I've been through multiple divorces. I, today's the day that we need to stop the voice of the enemy. Today's the day that you need to decide that your life will no longer be ruled by what was, but you will be, you will be ruled by the King of glory that you will be set free. Today's the day that you say, Lord, I choose Jesus. Lord, I choose freedom. Lord, I choose rejoicing. I choose confidence that even when I fail, I have an advocate with the Father who will pray with me and guide me, who will touch me and heal me. I stand today believing that you're able to do above and beyond what I could ask or think.